Thank you so much, Airdrie. Um, so here we are, November 1st. I can't believe it. Sorry. Uh, I want to once again say hi and welcome to all of you who are gathered in person, both here at our St. John site and in our Gander site. Welcome to you. We're glad that you're with us. And I think of anyone else who may be connected with the Crossing Church who's watching this online today. We're glad you're joining us and we welcome you. So if you can believe it, this is the final message in our series on the Lord's Prayer called 57 Words that change the world. Now this prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples when prayed, even with a modicum of faith, can move heaven and earth. Jesus invited his disciples back then, and he invites his disciples today to participate in the transformation of the world as we pray this prayer. And I find that mind-blowing. That's pretty amazing that we get to participate in the Lord's work of transformation of the world as we pray, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So we've learned that the first three petitions focus on who God is. And uh, the prayer, by the way, if you haven't caught on by now, is in Matthew 6. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, it's nestled within the Sermon on the Mount. And so there's six petitions in all, and the first three focus on who God is. We pray, your name be hallowed. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we've learned that the final three petitions focus on our needs, both our physical and our spiritual needs, as we pray, give us our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So we see that Jesus highlights all aspects of the kingdom life in this prayer, all that concerns God, all that's on his mind, all that God values, how we see him, how we see ourselves, and how we depend and trust on him to give us what we need. It's our relationship with him, our physical needs, and our relationship with others that this prayer um, addresses. So last week, we looked at the fifth petition, found in verse 12 of Matthew 6. And if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn there now with me. And that was, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now we learned that the mark of the life of a true disciple of Jesus will be one that, first of all, acknowledges the size of the debt that we owe God. And what is that debt we learned? It's complete and perfect obedience. That's the debt but that through Christ, he has forgiven us and he's paid that debt on our behalf. Therefore, we learned last week, if we truly have experienced God's love and his forgiveness, his grace and his mercy, we will then choose to forgive the debts of others. It was a difficult teaching. Anybody else find that difficult? You can say I. I want to counter, say nay. Yeah. Motion is carried. It was a challenging message um, for me. And like I said last week, I just need a mirror up here because I'm preaching to myself. So I'll bring out the mirror again because here we go. We are going <laughs> to, with this last petition, it's another challenging teaching of Jesus. This sixth and final petition found in Matthew 6, verse 13. But first we're going to pray as always because we can't understand God's word without the Spirit's help. So let's just pray right now. Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much for your presence with us and that your Holy Spirit um, helps us to see and to hear and to um, know what it is that you want to teach us. So I pray that you'd open our eyes, open our ears, let us hear you. Open our hearts, let us receive from you today what you have for us in your word. We ask these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Okay, that final petition, it says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So although some of us have been taught, I don't know about you, but I've been taught the version that says, but deliver us from evil. And Jesus used the definite article, however, the evil, and he even used it earlier in the Sermon on the Mount to refer to his enemy, the evil one. 
the devil. And another translation says, and don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. That's the New Living Translation. The New Revised Standard Version says, and do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. So this sixth and this final petition, though, is most puzzling, isn't it? Can you see why this is a puzzling petition? Well, let me let you in on something. We are asking God to do what is not in his character to do when we pray, lead us not into temptation, right? Have you ever thought about that? Scripture tells us that God doesn't tempt us. James 1.13 says that when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. And Dr. Daryl Johnson asked the same question. He says, the difficulty is this. Why ask God not to do what is not in the character of God to do? Would the God we meet in Jesus ever intentionally lead us into temptation? Then why bother praying, lead us not? Well, the key to this conundrum is the understanding around the word temptation. That word for temptation is also translated testing. Testing. Temptation and testing, though, you will agree with me, I think, are two very different things. And as Johnson notes, a test is something meant to prove a person's character and in the process, improve it. That's what a test is. Whereas a temptation is meant to entice a person to sin, to bring a person down in some way. And so you can see the two are very different. And that Greek word for temptation refers to a difficult situation or a challenge we face in life. Whether it's a test or a temptation, though, Johnson says, depends on who's behind it. Who's behind it. And the same word, by the way, is used in reference to refining gold, removing the impurities of the rough ore that is mined from the ground. So a goldsmith first takes that ore to reveal whether or not it's true gold. And then if it is, they refine it. They refine it into pure gold. And so the important thing is to note the rest of the petition, because left on its own, it may cause confusion around the meaning. It's the but. It's the but that helps us to better understand the meaning of the petition. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And again, Johnson helps out with a great explanation around this. He says the evil one seeks to turn tests into temptations. In this petition, Jesus reveals one of the most fundamental truths of life. Jesus' enemy turns tests into temptations. God's concern for us as his people is all about character development, about our character and how we are to become more and more like Jesus. And he does this through testing. And what's God's motivation? His motivation of improving and growing our Christian character is out of love. God desires us to become all that we were created to be in Jesus, ultimately becoming more and more like him. That's what the tests are all about. But the enemy of our souls, the one who prowls around like a roaring lion, does all he can to twist the tests that are meant to grow our character into temptations, to destroy our character. He doesn't want us to trust God, ultimately. He wants to question whether or not God is good. He doesn't want us to trust him. He doesn't want us to believe he has our best at heart through the testing. He wants us to fail the test. And he wants us, ultimately, to turn and walk away from our faith, to walk away from God. That is the motivation. So therefore, we could pray the petition like this. Father, as you lead us into the test, do not let the test become a temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Or as Johnson suggests, Father, you know that we cannot stand up under very much pressure. And as you lead us to the test, and all of life is a test, as you seek to improve our faith, do not let the test become a temptation, a seduction to sin, 
but deliver us from the subtle wiles of the deceiver against whom we're no match. Father, rescue us from the evil one. So we can turn to two main stories found in scripture where we get a great illustration of how testing got twisted. First of all, where there was a failure of the test into a temptation, and then where the test was passed perfectly. So we're, we're reminded um, that all of these tests are to prove our love and trust in God. That's what it's all about. And that the evil one, he wants to twist that, those tests into temptation. So in Genesis 3, and we highlighted this last week, we saw the serpent using subtle differences to twist what God had told Adam and Eve about the fruit of the trees in the garden. Very subtle twists. He used subtlety as he twisted the truth to make it seem that God was withholding something from them. That he was not giving all of his goodness, all that they deserved or could have. So just listen to this. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? No, God didn't say that. What did God really say? He said, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. See what he's doing there, what he was doing there. And Eve's response shows that seeds of doubt are kind of being sown in her heart. Listen, she says, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Now, just FYI, the tree of life is in the middle of the garden, and it says the tree of the knowledge of good and evil are there as well, is there as well. But notice that she left out, we are free to eat from any, and adds a prohibition. This is new, let's just tack this on. Not only, you know, can we eat from any, um, but we must not even touch that fruit. Now, God didn't say that. That is not what he said. So seeds of doubt and suspicion were sown, and what was a test that was meant to manifest itself into a great trust in God, in his goodness for them, was twisted by the enemy into the negative making it seem like God was keeping something from them, holding something back. And of course, we know the story. They failed the test. They failed the test. Now, I want to be clear here. While the enemy twisted the truth, Adam and Eve weren't helpless victims in this situation. They chose to take the fruit and to eat it, resulting, of course, in most deadly consequences. And as James 1.14 reminds us, temptations always come from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. So we have these temptations, these tests that are turned into temptations by our enemy, but then we have our own desires as well that get turned into temptations. Now, jump ahead to Matthew 4 with me. Are you still with me? You can say yes. Okay, you're still with me. Good. You're still with me in Gander? Please say yes. Good. Uh, Matthew 4, Jesus was tempted or he was tested in the desert. Now, who led Jesus into the wilderness? It was the Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit. It was the Spirit who led him to be tempted or tested by the devil. And what did Satan do? Well, he used the same strategies with Jesus, but he doesn't know who he's dealing with. He's trying to get Jesus to doubt the Father's love for him. He twisted the word of God to try to entice Jesus to turn away from the Father and pledge allegiance to him. Imagine. He tried to get Jesus to doubt his identity. If you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. I mean, 40 days of fasting, he'd be hungry. I mean, I would think so. Uh, so what was the enemy doing here? He was trying to sow seeds of suspicion and doubt. Something like this, Jesus, if you are who you really say you are, you can turn these stones to bread. And oh, by the way, if the Father really loved you, why would he be putting you in this desert with only rocks and stones? Doesn't seem right, Jesus. 
Does God really love you? And of course, Jesus doesn't give in. He knows the ploys of his enemy, who is by no means an equal adversary. Don't ever think the evil one is an equal adversary. Not even close. And Jesus passes the test. So you can see by these two stories why Jesus tells us to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Lord, we will be tested, but the one who wants us to turn away from you to doubt you is at work turning the test into temptations. Rescue us! Rescue us! And when you think of it, right, all of life is a test. It's all a test. Throughout school, we all had to take tests, right? Yeah, we had to take tests. If I want to know if I'm good at math, I have to be tested in math. And by the way, I was tested in math, and I am not good at math. If you want to know if you've mastered something, we're usually given a test in order to prove it, aren't we? Students are in the middle of midterms, I think, right now. They're being tested in what they have learned. And it's easy to say, I'm good at something. I can tell you I, I'm really good at scuba diving. Or I can tell you I'm really good at mountain climbing. Or I'm really good, I don't know, speaking French. But then someone tests me. Nope, <laughs> it's not true. And how can I say that I'm good at something? It's so easy to do that. But um, unless I'm tested in what I'm saying, I, I will not know if it's true. So it's the same with our faith and trust in Jesus. The only way to prove we trust him is to be tested in that faith. And God puts us in situations every day. When you think about it, every day we are in situations where he's testing our character. You know, I heard someone once say the most spiritual thing we'll ever do is make a choice. Is make a choice. Think about that. Every day we are faced with choices. And it doesn't have to be a big test either. Think of it. Um, you find a wallet in the parking lot outside a store. What do you do? See how a test can become a temptation? Hmm. Or you discover you walked out of the grocery store. I don't know how many times I've done this. And you've discovered that you haven't paid for something. What do you do? It's a test. But it can also turn into a temptation. Do you see what I'm saying? It starts with small choices that we make every day. And what other everyday tests do we experience? I know you can think of them all. How we choose to respond to others is a test, isn't it? How we choose to respond. Especially if they're disappointing us or saying something hurtful. Or if our kids do something you ask them not to do. Or they do something you've asked them not to do. Or ask them to do. It was clear earlier. You know what I mean. How do we respond? How do we respond to our children, for those of us who are parents? We can choose to get angry, can't we? We can choose to get mad. And you say, well, wait, Pastor Carolyn, I don't choose to get angry. They made me angry. They made me angry. How many of us have said that? You make me angry. I couldn't help it. They made me angry. That's one way to release ourselves, isn't it? Of responsibility. It wasn't my fault. It was your fault. But I'm sorry to give you all the bad news. Nobody can make you anything. You choose your response. And it's a test that can easily turn into a temptation. Now, those are just small examples of everyday tests that God uses to develop our character from the moment we put our feet on the floor in the morning. And we know, though, that there are even more serious tests, aren't there? We need to really get real about that. Tests in marital faithfulness, tests in singleness and sex, tests in our thought life, in being truthful in our dealings. We are faced with choices that will either bring us closer to God or that will take us away from him. Tests that the enemy wants to twist into temptations. So we fail. And then what do we experience? Guilt and shame. What about the really big tests in life? 
Oh boy, those times we find ourselves in the wilderness. There we are out in the desert. We find ourselves in circumstances that are so difficult. And we can't imagine how we're going to get through. The enemy of our souls uses the same old strategy, doesn't he? In fact, Daryl Johnson says that the enemy has five strategies he tries to use against us, hoping to turn tests into temptations, hoping to get us not to trust God. I think it's worth just looking at these for the next couple of minutes. Um, First, Johnson says the enemy wants us to forget key words in Scripture that remind us that God is generously and lovingly disposed toward us. You know, we talked earlier about Eve, how she left out key words back in Genesis 3, and so did the enemy, making it seem that God was withholding something from her and Adam. And so how many times have we committed scripture maybe to memory, but have left out some words that are really important to remind us that God is lovingly disposed towards us. He is for us. He's not against us. And next he tries to get us to focus on our negative circumstance or our circumstances that we find ourselves in, right? You ever notice that? You just get fixated on the circumstance, the negative circumstance, instead of focusing on God. And then once we're squarely focused on that negative circumstance, he sows seeds of suspicion. He tries to get us to make sense of it. And we end up making actually negative deductions. You know, if God really loves me, why would he allow this to be happening? Hmm. Which leads to the false deduction then. He mustn't love me. See how this happens? And then once we've landed on the lie that God doesn't care and we doubt his love, we try to force his hand. He's... Daryl Johnson says, the evil one is always suggesting to us ways we can get God to prove his love for us, but it never works. For one thing, God will not play the game. And for another, if God did what we suggested, we wouldn't be satisfied. And it would not prove his love. It would mean that God is not God because he, like us, can be manipulated. We cannot force God's hand. We can't manipulate him. And then the final strategy is to get us to take things into our own hands. To turn from trusting God to taking control. Anybody here ever done this? Oh, yeah. Yes. More confessions with Pastor Carolyn. I say to myself, or you might say, well, God, you're obviously AWOL in this situation. You're gone. You're nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. And I guess I just can't trust you now, can I? Now it's all up to me. And we no longer trust God. And tragically, for some of us, we may even walk away from our faith. We walk away. And I think, too, when it comes to testing and temptations, one of the biggest dangers that we face as followers of Jesus is to think that we're above failing. No, no, no. I've dealt with all that. I'm good. I've got that down. To think that that will never happen to us. We say, oh, we hear about somebody. Whew, look what they did. Well, I'm so glad that it never happened to me. Oh, careful, careful. You know, you can think I've got this lust thing down or this anger thing or this you fill in the blank thing under control. I've arrived. And we pridefully let our guard down. Talk about an open door for the enemy. And Paul warns us, about, warns us about this. In 1 Corinthians 10, verses 12 to 13, he says, So if you think you're standing firm, be careful you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 
We pray to Jesus, deliver us, rescue us, Lord, from the schemes of the evil one who tries to turn your tests, God, that are meant to grow our faith and trust in you into temptations that try to get us to doubt your goodness and your love for us. Now, the good news is this. Are you ready for some good news? Yeah. Here's some good news. We don't need to be afraid. <laughs> we can have confidence that the Holy Spirit that is at work, who is that work in us, will give us the strength and the power to overcome the schemes of the enemy. He's no match. The Holy Spirit living in us is far greater than he that's in the world. Do you believe this? We have the very presence of Jesus through the Holy Spirit within us who can empower us and help us when we are being tested. In those times when we find ourselves giving in to a temptation, when we fail, and we all fail, Anybody here ever not fail? Good, I rest my case. We all will fail. We have the comfort knowing that when we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us. Praise God for that. So those times that we're tempted to doubt God's love and goodness, we need only now to look at the cross. When we're doubting his goodness for us, when we wonder, do you really love us? Do you really love me, God? Look what I'm going through right now. We need to then focus on the cross of Christ. And we're going to prepare in just a moment to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. We're reminded of the agony that Jesus experienced in the other garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prayed to his Heavenly Father to have that cup taken from him if it was at all possible. And that cup? That cup was experiencing the unbelievable agony of the cross. But we know that Jesus ultimately prayed, didn't he? Yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus chose to go to the cross. He chose the way of obedience, trusting in God's plan to restore us to him. Displaying that magnificent, extravagant love of God for you and for me. And when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we begin a capital L life, not a lowercase l life, uppercase. How about uppercase L-I-F-E? Real life. A, a life that is fulfilled because we're in a relationship with a living God. That we have his very presence with us. And a real uppercase life that's lived growing with a growing dependence on God to empower us so that we can pass the trust tests of life that develop our character as we become more and more like Jesus. That's the goal. And this is why we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. What I would like to do is, as we normally do, this will be our final time, not our final time ever praying the Lord's Prayer in the service, but at the end of our message. And I would like to invite those of you who would like to and are able to perhaps stand and we'll say this for the final time. And then we'll move into our time of the Lord's Supper and celebrating communion. Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom power and the glory forever and ever amen father we thank you we thank you for this prayer that jesus gave his disciples long ago and that we get to participate in the transformation of the world we partner with you lord when we pray it father i do pray lord that you would help us to stand the tests that come along to strengthen our character 
that you would um, help us to be aware of the schemes of the enemy and that you would protect us, Father, that you would just cover us with your uh, protection, Lord. We thank you that we don't need to be afraid because you are with us and you are greater within us than he that's in the world. And we just thank you now, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. So for those of you who may be new to our church, usually on the first Sunday of the month, we celebrate what we call the Lord's Supper or Communion. And of course, it's been looking very different for us these days. Um, and you'll notice uh, at both sites, at our site here in St. John's and our site in Gander, um, you'll notice that there are these little cups and you can just uh, take a look at those now. Um, and you'll notice that you can open up the cup and there's two layers. There's the juice layer and then there is the wafer on top and then the juice on the bottom. And so the wafer represents, of course, the bread, which represents Christ's body broken for us. And then underneath that is the juice. And that juice represents, it's a symbol of Christ's blood shed for us on the cross. And so this is a time for those who put their faith and trust in Jesus to participate as we remember and acknowledge what he did for us on the cross. And so I'll do the communion introduction, and then what we will do is we will listen to a song that will help to prepare our hearts. It's a time for us to allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and just to really remember. Because when we forget what Jesus did for us, it affects our relationships with others, doesn't it? It's that whole forgiveness piece again. So let me do the introduction. We invite all who love the Lord Jesus, who've repented of sin, and who've decided to follow Christ in newness of life to come to this table. It is the table of the Lord. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful to you for your love shown to us through the cross of Christ. We thank you, Father. For the bread we're about to partake, representing Jesus' broken body for us. We thank you for the juice, God, representing his blood shed for us. And it's through, through the power of the cross, Father, that we get to uh, have our sins forgiven, that we get to be reconciled with you, Father. So we are grateful for the cross of Christ and for what it means for us and that it shows us your love for us. We never have to doubt that. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the band is going to play a song right now. So I just invite you to just pray, to just be thinking about what the cross of, the, of Christ means to you. Sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't hear. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't hear. So lay down your burdens. Lay
rest. Sinner, be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can feel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can feel. So lay down your Let us eat this bread in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice for us, and let us be thankful. Jesus said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Amen. Now we'll come and you join us now as we sing our final song. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life I won't turn back I know you are near and I will fear no evil for my God is with me and if my God is with me whom then shall I fear whom then shall storm oh no you never let go every high and every low oh no you never let go oh you never let go of me 
can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on. A glorious light beyond all compare. And there will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes, we'll live to know you here on the earth. And I will fear no evil, for my God is with me. And if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Oh, no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on and there will be an end to these troubles but until that day comes still i will praise you still i will praise you oh no you never let go through the calm and through the storm oh Almost made it. No sticker today. That's okay. Um, just a reminder, we are not permitted to remain and visit in our building, but it's a sunny, beautiful day. And if you grab your jacket, um, we can connect with one another outside for a brief time. We're so grateful um, that you've joined us here today as well as online. Now, may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. May God bless you all as you go today, and thank you for joining us.